well, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, and we definitely know that on the female side that things have been excluded, like we can't find any particular reason. So what's the difference between unexplained infertility and idiopathic infertility? Um, you know, everybody uses those terms interchangeably. To me, they're not the same. Um, idiopathic, if you look at the derivation of that, really it's due to one's own personal cause. So it's saying like there is a cause. Um, so basically with idiopathic is we know there's a cause, but we don't know the cause of the cause. So, you know, two really good examples of that. One is with a semen analysis. So if we know that the semen analysis is abnormal, but we just don't know why it's abnormal, that to me is more idiopathic, right? And that might lead us down a different diagnostic path. Um, and in a female, if you have a young, healthy woman and she has um, a low AMH, again, that is more idiopathic. Oftentimes that's getting labeled as unexplained, but it's really not. We know that you know, in a 30-year-old, having an AMH of 0.3 is not normal. We just don't know why in that particular woman that's not normal. So again, just to drive this point home a little bit further, um, you know, in, in the male, I mean, 40 to 50% uh, of the semen analysis um, and the infertility could be idiopathic versus truly unexplained might be a little bit lower. So again, just driving home more of the same point in that, you know, we know that uh, unexplained infertility is pretty high. I'm focusing, you know, a lot on the male. It seems like in our clinics, you know, we have the women that are coming to us. But the reality is, is that um, the male should be coming more. And I really think that that's something that we should be focusing on in, uh, in the future. So is the male more important? I, I actually think it, um, they are. And you know, if you talk to someone like Dr. Magarelli, like he really pushes for that as well. I was talking to <clears throat> someone last night, you know, I think Mark, and we were talking about um, the male in treatment. And I don't know how often you guys get the men to come in. I mean, in the ideal situation, I would treat the couple always when I'm treating an infertility patient. Um, but I had a first case this year um, of the many treatments, uh, patients that I've treated, and it was I did not treat the wife, and I just treated the man, and they conceived. And I thought, oh, that was pretty cool. We should try and do that more often. <laughs> so the World Health Organization um, sperm analysis guidelines, I'm sure you all know that in 2010 they changed those guidelines, and they actually lowered the parameters for the semen analysis. So. Again, if you guys treat infertility, you know, I don't think the semen analysis is a good predictor of fertility. Um, many OBGYNs, in my area at least, still think like, oh yeah, your semen analysis is normal, so you know, your fertility is fine. Um, but the problem with this is the data that they used, um, the study that they used to create these um, new reference ranges, they, they measured, and you know, if, if everyone's gonna be here tomorrow, I think you'll hear Dr. Turek talk about this, is they measured fertility um, in men that had already fathered children. So the question is, well, aren't they measuring the wrong uh, population? Um, I, I think they are, I mean, I think they're looking. And, and besides the fact that there were some other uh, criticisms of the way, the methodology that they used um, to come up with this, um, but again, I think the important thing is, you know, look at these ranges. First of all, I always get the ranges. If a patient comes in and says, oh, the sperm analysis was normal, I say I'd like to see it. Um, what's normal to them <clears throat> is not necessarily normal to me. And if somebody comes in and they have uh, a semen analysis that's within the normal range, you know, these ranges were lowered significantly. If the patient is on the low end of this range, then they're on the low end of the low already. So I'm gonna stop and pause and think, hmm, what else you know, might be going on? Besides the fact that we know we can't measure things like DNA fragmentation in a sperm analysis, that's not gonna show up. I actually will talk about that a little bit as well. I think you know, that's something we should be focusing on more frequently. So what are some possible causes of what's going on here when um, in the male in particular? I think immunological issues are pretty common, anti-sperm antibodies. Um, there's an expert, Dr. Glenn Chapman, and he thinks that you know, up to 40% of unexplained male infertility is due to some immunology issue. 
Um, and he even says, quote, the diagnosis of immunological infertility should be suspected in all cases of unexplained male infertility. So obviously we then, you know, we have genetic and epigenetic in, uh, influences, heat, tobacco, alcohol, lifestyle factors. Um, and then again, sperm dis dysfunction. So back to the DNA fragmentation issue, um, it's a known, you know, in some of these studies, it's been a known uh, cause um, of, of fertility issues. Um, and you know, what I always find interesting, we're gonna talk about oxidative stress. My last bullet point here, um, just in red, is oxidative stress can imp impair, you know, the sperm process and the production but even if that sperm is normal, it still you know, might not be able, it might be able to fertilize the egg, it might not, but that doesn't mean anything. And, and in some of the studies, there has been increased um, miscarriage and spontaneous abortion rates. So even if, the, if everything is fertilized, they do ICSI, they force these things together, um, some of the research shows that that still might not be a good, good thing. So in TCM, we all know there's no such thing as a one-on-one -on -one, one -on -one correlation, but I put this in here. Because I do sort of think about these things. If somebody comes in, again, um, if you know, they have kidney yin, yang, jing deficiency, I might think, OK, what's going on with that sperm? Even if the analysis looks normal, um, I might think is, think, is the sperm impaired somehow? You know, what has their lifestyle been like for the past 20 years? Um, are they routine um, pot smoker? Right? It's legal now, so why not? Um, I had an RE the other day tell a patient um, don't worry, we're going to do IVF. Don't worry, your daily, your nightly pot smoking is not affecting your sperm. Um, so, so oxidative stress, sort of one of these buzzwords, right? Everybody's taking antioxidants. The supplement industry, multi-billion dollar industry. I'm, I'm putting together another presentation right now on, um, you know, are we over supplementing in infertility care? I, I think we might be. But you know, we just have to remember, you guys know this, that it should be this balance like everything else, that you know, we don't want to be inundating our body with too many antioxidants if we don't need it. You know, I have a lot of patients that um, already live a fairly clean lifestyle. I'm not necessarily suggesting they take a ton of, ton of supplements. So um, yeah, just be, be, be cautious of that. So is the sperm analysis enough? Interestingly, you know, almost 30% of men can exhibit the normal semen analysis and still not be able to help their partner conceive. So something else is going on. We just don't know what it is yet because we don't have significant testing to figure that out. So we've covered this pretty much you know, in the female. Look, if the tubes are open, we know, and they're ovulating, um, and the semen analysis, again, is normal. This is how Western medicine is saying, like, oh, well, it's unexplained. Nothing's going on. So in the female, what are some things that we can look at? Well, we know that there could be ovarian issues, right? So, um, you know, low reserve, whatnot, um, ovulation issues, uh, poor follicle maturation, there could be luteal phase defect. I use BBTs in my chart as another diagnostic uh, tool. I don't re rely exclusively on them, but I use them to help fill in the holes of the big picture. Um, if somebody has a really long follicular phase, you know, that might tell me there might be some ovulatory issues, obviously, if they have a low luteal phase. If they have a slow rise, um, BBT, then I might think there might be something ovulatory going on. Again, I don't know about you guys, but in my area, most of the docs are telling the patients to stop charting. Um, we could talk, you know, an hour about that. But I love that um, information. So, and again, are the tubes open? But I think that some of these less explored things that I you know, tell my patients, look, you have to be your own best advocate. And I sort of you know, poke them a little bit and get them to think about other things so that they can question these things with their doctor. Are there immunology issues going on with the female as well? Um, the endometrium and endometriosis, you know, I think this is happening in a fair number of, of cases. And then we have all of our stress and lifestyle uh, issues as well. So there's a lot of information on this slide. Really, um, the, the point that I, I want to drive home is that um, melatonin, basically, um, everybody takes it for sleep, you know, and there's been some research out there showing that melatonin can be helped to nourish um, egg quality. The problem is melatonin is also an antioxidant. So again, if the patient is fairly healthy 
and we don't suspect that they have a lot of inflammation in their body, um, why would they take this? Um, also, why would they take this? The research, as far as I know, this research on melatonin has been specifically around using melatonin in a stimulated